This video is kindly sponsored by Surfshark. Why did God create us? We're going to answer that question. But are you? Are you really? Or are you going to answer this question just as you answered the question of why God won't heal amputees? Which is to say, not answer it. Well, let's find out, shall we? If Got Questions has got answers. You can also discover more on gotquestions.org. The short answer to the question, why did God create us, is for his pleasure. All right, since Got Questions has given us the short answer up front, let me give you the short question and its concerns up front. If we were to ask a follower of the gods of Olympus why their gods created us, so why Prometheus created us from clay and Athena breathed life into that clay, any answer would have to take into account the alleged attributes and characteristics of the gods. And since the Olympian gods are very human in their appetite, the question isn't all that pressing. There's no tension between the gods' attributes and them creating. A Greek apologist could simply say, the gods created us because they wanted servants, or because they were bored, or indeed, the apologist could simply say, we don't know, and there's no tension. But when this question is asked in relation to the god of Abraham, there is significant tension. God and God alone has a seity. God and God alone exists by his own power. Because upon taking into account God's alleged attributes and characteristics, and especially his aseity, that is, his quality or state of being absolutely independent, it becomes obvious that the answer can't be that he wanted to create people for, well, any reason. Because per his absolute self-sufficiency and independence, he can't want for anything. Stated otherwise, to assign a motive to God, any motive, is to compromise his aseity. And this is just where the tension begins. Once we consider the other attributes that are assigned to God, such as his omnibenevolence, the issue is compounded. If God is all-loving, then he's not going to want to create a situation in which sentient beings suffer, is he? Now, one might respond that so long as creating us has a net positive on overall well-being, then it's justified. But this too compounds the issue, as it presupposes that an all-loving God would use some of us as a mere means to an end, making God, as James Fodor has put it, a gigachad consequentialist. And if we consider some of the most upheld doctrines, such as the doctrine of eternal torment in hell, then the compounded situation becomes utterly absurd. For under this rubric, God would have known, per his omnipotence, that the vast majority of his children would end up in hell suffering eternally. And yet he still decided to actualize such a ghastly situation, despite also being omnibenevolent. So, as I trust I've made clear, the answer to the question of why God created us, or indeed anything, is going to have to account for, among other considerations, God's aseity, omnibenevolence, omnipotence, and the many doctrines derived from scripture. In short, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-loving, and absolutely independent. God can't be improved upon in any way. And so, for what reason would he have to create? Anyhow, with that, let's get back to God questions. Now I'm sure by now you're well aware of the many benefits of a VPN. They protect your online privacy, enable you to enjoy region-restricted content on such services as Netflix, help you dodge geographic price discrimination, and in the case of Surshark VPN, they even provide an antivirus and protect your identity with data breach monitoring. You know, considering just how long I spend on the internet, I get more use out of my Surfshark subscription than I do any of my other online subscriptions. Surfshark has kindly teamed up with me to offer you, my subscribers, a special Black Friday deal of 85% off and three extra months free. Yeah, it's a hell of a bargain. Combine this with their 100% money back guarantee for your first 30 days and it's simply a steal. You've got nothing to lose by trying them out. So, if you want to bump up your online privacy and fancy watching some shows that only air in different countries, then here's a really easy way to do it. You can find my link below in the description, or indeed as the pinned comment. Thank you. The short answer to the question, why did God create us, is for his pleasure. Revelation says you are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Colossians reiterates that point. All things were created by him and for him. Being created for God's pleasure does not mean humanity was made to entertain God or provide him with amusement. God is a creative being 
and it gives him pleasure to create. God is a personal being, and it gives him pleasure to have other beings he can have a genuine relationship with. God questions have given us a lot to consider here, and we're going to break down each and every node. But notice that they fail to even explain why the question of why God would create is of concern. Indeed, they haven't even remotely given the question the floor before getting to their answer. There's been no mention of a seity, let alone any of God's other alleged attributes, and consequently, God Question's viewers are unaware, completely unaware, of why this question is of concern. But we're going to have to put this failure to the side. Let's break down what God Questions had to say by, well, each note at a time. They began by quoting Revelations. Revelation says, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. The presupposition in this verse is that, by virtue of creating, the Creator is worthy of praise, admiration, and indeed glory from its creation. Putting aside that this is miles away from an answer to the question, is it true? Well, consider parents. In a fundamental sense, through creatio ex materia, biological parents create their children. But does this entail that the parents are automatically worthy of praise, admiration, and glory? Judging by how most of us conduct our lives, or let's say our moral intuition, the answer is clearly no. Respect is earned, not freely given. Our children do not have an obligation to like us, let alone give us glory or love or respect. It's a reciprocal relationship, and one that both parties maintain according to their respective autonomy. From the very get-go, then, Got Questions is predicating their case on an extremely controversial premise. Colossians reiterates that point. All things were created by him and for him. And this bit of scripture is arguably even more controversial, and for several reasons. Suppose that a couple created a child for themselves, that is, they brought the child into being entirely for their own glory, entirely for their own pleasure. Does that seem compatible with being loving, let alone all-loving? Well, according to many, including myself, the answer would be a resounding no. To create children exclusively for oneself is to treat children, humans, sentient beings, as a mere means to an end, and not as an end in themselves. And this contradicts the moral compass of just about everybody. When it comes to God, however, this issue is significantly intensified. Unlike humans, God doesn't need anything from anyone. And so even creating something for himself has to be understood in a very weird way. God can't want us because wanting something implies deficiency, and God isn't deficient in any way. He can't be improved upon. But putting aside his aseity, the more prominent concern is against his omnibenevolence. Considering that the vast majority of God's children are destined to be eternally tormented, since most people are not Christians, God must have an utterly phenomenal reason for creating and orchestrating such a ghastly situation, right? No good God would ensure the eternal anguish of billions simply for his own glory, right? Right? Being created for God's pleasure does not mean humanity was made to entertain God or provide him with amusement. God is a creative being, and it gives him pleasure to create. Right, so God Question's answer to the question of why did God create is because it gives him pleasure to create. And if we ask why God gets pleasure from creating, their answer is that God is a creative being. And if we ask why God is a creative being, they answer that it's because it gives him pleasure. And if we ask why it gives him pleasure, they answer it's because he's a creative being. And around and around we go. This is a non-answer. It has no explanatory scope. More importantly, though, we have to ask what pleasure, precisely, God gets from creating. Because per his aseity, he can't gain anything from it. He is perfect and the act of creating doesn't somehow make him better. What we need, then, is forgot questions to clearly define pleasure in such a way that doesn't presuppose deficiency. God is a personal being, and it gives him pleasure to have other beings he can have a genuine relationship with. Now, that implies that God needs genuine relationships, doesn't it? But he can't, because that would be a deficiency. He doesn't need anything. What's more, what happens to his children that simply are not convinced that he exists because there's just essentially nowhere near enough evidence to believe in him? Oh yeah, that's right. Being all loving, that God will eternally forsake them. Makes sense, right? 
Except no, no it doesn't. Being made in the image and likeness of God, human beings have the ability to know God and therefore love Him, worship Him, serve Him, and fellowship with Him. Yeah. And likewise, children being made in the image of their parents have the ability to love their parents, worship their parents, and fellowship with their parents. And if they don't, then they're deserving of infinite torment. Sure. God did not create human beings because he needed them. As God, he needs nothing. In all eternity past, he felt no loneliness, so he was not looking for a friend. He loves us, but this is not the same as needing us. If we had never existed, God would still be God. The unchanging one, the I am, was never dissatisfied with his own eternal existence. So why, then, create? Why would an all-loving, completely self-sufficient God create a world so beset by suffering? When he made the universe, he did what pleased himself. But what precisely did he satisfy? What does it mean to say that creating pleased God if he's entirely satisfied? God Questions is insisting that God created us for his own pleasure, but they are failing to explain what pleasure even is. Pleasure can't be what it is in every other context. We're not getting an answer here at all from God Questions. And since God is perfect, his action was perfect. Sure. Just as when God commanded the execution of little boys and the enslavement of little virgin girls, it was a perfect action. It was vibrating love, let's say. Whatever God does, it's perfect. Got ya. Give me a frickin' break. It was very good. Also, God did not create peers or beings equal to himself. Logically, he could not do so. If God were to create another being of equal power, intelligence, and perfection, then he would cease to be the one true God for the simple reason that there would be two gods, and that would be an impossibility. The Lord is God. Besides him, there is no other. Anything that God creates must, of necessity, be lesser than he. So, to get us back on the rails, the question is, why did God create anything? And so you might be wondering, why, then, are God questions answering the irrelevant question of why God didn't create us as gods? Well, join the club. What we're witnessing here is something that apologists regularly do when confronted with difficult questions. They answer questions that are within the vicinity, or at least close to the vicinity, but fail to actually grapple, much less answer, the primary question. The thing made can never be greater than, or as great as, the one who made it. Well, that's an interesting way of saying that Judaism is greater than Christianity, ain't it? And it's also, of course, a lovely thing to tell your child. Recognizing the complete sovereignty and holiness of God, we are amazed that he would take man and crown him with glory and honor, and that he would condescend to call us friends. God created us for his pleasure, and so that we, as his creation, would have the pleasure of knowing him. But not if we're non-believers, right? If we're earnestly not convinced of God's existence, then it's not really a pleasure, is it? We're going to end up being eternally tormented for a crime of disbelief, despite the fact that this seems obviously to contradict omnibenevolence. But I guess that the theists could somehow define eternal torture as good. They could, well, say that if God does it, then it's just necessarily good. And since God is perfect, his action was perfect. That answers the question, why did God create us? Except it doesn't. Answering the question would involve, at the bare minimum, actually unpacking why the question is of concern. That way, Got Questions flock would actually understand why the question is pressing. They'd understand why answering the question of why God didn't create us as gods is a red herring. What's more, if Got Questions is going to insist that God created us for his pleasure, then they're going to have to expand upon what they mean by pleasure, since they can't mean pleasure in the general sense of the word, that is, a feeling of happy satisfaction or enjoyment, since per God's aseity, He's already perfectly happy. He's perfectly satisfied. But God Questions didn't do this. So, why did God create? Well, one thing's for sure. God Questions ain't God Answers. So what we're left with is an absolutely independent, self-sufficient being creating for evidently no reason, despite the fact that in doing so he ensured the infinite suffering upon his children, rendering his omnibenevolence mute. But, of course, we can get round his omnibenevolence friction by simply insisting that whatever God does, it's good. 
Anyhow, as always, thank you kindly for the view and an extra special thank you to my wonderful patrons and YouTube members. Thank you very, very much for supporting me in my counter-apologetic pursuit.